Bridging the Gap with Dr. Jacob Wilson. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Jacob Wilson, and this is Charlie Ottinger. What's up, everyone? Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most exciting topics um, for you because it really is all about when do you grow during a set, okay? So today, we're going to be talking about effective or stimulating reps. So in other words, when you train and you do a set, at what point in time do you start to grow, okay? What point in time do you start to make gains in strength? So this could be one of the most important podcasts that you've actually come across. Before you actually, before we actually get into that, um, you know, uh, if you want to show your support, the best way you can do it is you can subscribe to the channel. um, You can hit that like button. Most importantly, if if you want to help other people in need of growth, you can share this um, and you can hit that that bell. Um, So. Going into this again, we're going to be talking about effective or stimulating reps, which is uh, we're talking about the point in time during a set when you grow. How would you, from a science perspective, Charlie, define an effective or a stimulating rep? Well, I know the classic example came from Arnold back when he was lifting, right? And he always said it's the last couple of reps in a set that separates the champions from the people who are not the champions because right. that's where he grows. And I think it was, uh, it might have been Dorian Yates or, or maybe Tom Platts who always said, I don't start counting the reps until, they, until it starts hurting. Right. 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 So, you know, even bodybuilders of the past, <clears throat> before we were doing any research at all into this, knew that there was a point in the set that made the difference, right? There was a point in the set where the skinny guys would quit and the big guys would keep repping out. Right. right? So, over the years, as research has evolved, we've been able to answer this almost indirectly, right? So there's, I think the terms effective reps and stimulating reps have come from, you know, a couple different big brains in the field over time, but we've seen the theories, we've been able to work around the theories, take, you know, peek around the corners of each theory and decide what we agree with and what we don't agree with. So essentially a stimulating rep or an effective rep is a repetition where you have maximal muscle activation because you want as many muscle fibers to grow as possible. And two, it has to occur at a slow contraction velocity. And this is due to the uh, speed force or force speed curve that Fernando is going to put up here in a little bit. Essentially, the slower a single muscle fiber contracts, the more force or tension it experiences. So essentially, all in all, we think that the more activation you have, the slower the muscle is contracting, that's a better uh, stimulus for growth. But why can't we just lift slow then? Yeah, so that's that's a big thing too. So a lot of people will go um, when we talk about lifting slow in this maximal activation thing. We're talking about motor unit recruitment or muscle fiber activation. You get to realize you have small muscle fibers, medium sized muscle fibers, really large muscle fibers, and we recruit those muscle fibers based on fatigue. We recruit them based on weight. Okay, um, and in essence. If we are lifting really lightweight, really, really slowly, um, the weight's light, the tension's not high, um, and because the um, the essentially the load or the fatigue aren't high, I'm just lifting slow. That's not going to generate a lot of tension. It's also not going to recruit your fast switch muscle fibers, your larger muscle fibers. So lifting slow is only ingredient um, by itself, but what Charlie's talking about is when I'm lifting heavy and I have a lot of fatigue or I'm lifting a high load, I'm forced to lift slow because I'm fatigued or the load is high, okay? So that's when tension is maximal. But if I'm just gonna lift really light weights and lift really slow and think I'm generating a lot of tension, it's not gonna be the case. And lots of studies support that. That doesn't really help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think one of the landmark studies from you know the past 10 years was from Sunstrup uh, and colleagues in 2012. And this is one that a lot of people have kind of based these theories around because we know maximal activation is important, right? We want as many fibers to grow as possible. So what Sunstrup and, and others did was, I, I don't remember the movement, it was lateral raises. Or, it was a really simple exercise, it was. It was but like they measured muscle activation at a variety of intensities or a percentage of one RM, and then they track that activation throughout a set. 
And what they found was that lighter intensities, you got maximal muscle activation around three to five reps to failure for most intensities. So what Arnold and Dorian Yates and all those guys are saying is true. You know, the, those last three to five reps before failure were the most effective ones. But the other cool thing they found was that using 80% of your 1RM or above also led to maximal activation. Yeah. So we're seeing that, yes, lightweights and heavyweights can both promote maximal activation, which is what we want for part of that stimulating rep component. So essentially, we can take this and say, as long as you're using lightweights, you train to failure, but you can also use heavyweights and get a similar growth stimulus. And we see that pretty often in the research. As long as everything is done to failure, similar growth between groups, right? Right, and I think going, going to the point, you take two different training styles, a couple of things. Number one, there's a number of different ways to grow, but all of them require stimulating reps. So again, if you go back to that study, <clears throat> if you're lifting at 50% of your 1RM, Okay, so if you can lift, if you can bench 200 pounds and you're lifting at 100 pounds, okay, you might be able to get, I don't know, probably, you, you might be able to get a lot of repetitions. At least 20, 30 uh, reps. Right, <laughs> at least 20, 30 repetitions. Okay, but let's just say it's 20 repetitions. What this study showed is it wasn't until rep 18, 19, and 20 that you maximally stimulated um, uh, the muscle fibers. Remember, if you don't recruit a muscle fiber, it can't grow, okay? It won't be placed under tension. You have to recruit the muscle fiber to stimulate it to grow, okay? But like Charlie said, if you did 80% of your 1RM, how many reps do you think you get with 80? You know? yeah, how bad you want it, eight? Yeah, so let's Probably say- Probably five to eight. Five to eight, depending on your conditioning, mm -hmm. um, your style of training. So the, basically at 80%, you were kind of stimulating uh, all your muscle fibers right away, okay? So what this says is an intensity can automatically trigger the, a point where all the reps are stimulating. So again, let's say if I was lifting, uh, a, if, I, if I had the conditioning, and this goes to conditioning too, by the way, but if I had the conditioning to do eight reps at 80% of my 1RM, the whole set, close to the whole set might be stimulating, you know, in, yeah. a, in a sense. Yeah. That's where you look at old school guys like Dorian Yates, right? Blood and guts. This dude was lifting heavy as hell and growing like one of the largest human beings to ever walk the face of the planet Earth. Um, so, but on the other hand, you could lift at 100 pounds and still get those stimulating reps at reps 17, 18, 19, 20, okay? So, um, now, let's, let's say this. So a couple of things that we can really take from this. One is, well, um, why not just get it over with and lift at 80% or above all my workout, all, all my workouts, you know what I mean? Yeah, how, how do your knees feel about that? <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so guys, we're obviously talking about one of the most important ways to grow, which is stimulating reps. Um, another important way to grow is your knowledge. Like how much knowledge you have, the more knowledge you have, the more you can grow because the more we can manipulate your training. So Charlie and I and, and Fernando, um, we created the Muscle PhD Academy, which is a 30 week course. And in this course, um, you will, it's like 150 videos over 30, yeah, over 30 weeks time. Uh, in the Muscle PhD Academy, I'm gonna tell you this right now. You will gain more information and more knowledge on how to grow than 99.9% of people with advanced degrees. I'd wager that. I'd, I'd wager if you took like 99 people with their PH, 100 people with their PhDs, you'll know more than 99 of them when it comes to the science of strength and the science of gaining muscle and the science of transforming your body, you'll know more than 99 of 100 of them. You'll know how to apply it Better than all. Better than all yeah. of them. You'll know how to apply it better than all of them. Um, and so anyway, uh, we got a little surprise for you. We're gonna show you just a quick preview of uh, one of the lectures in this course. And um, if you want more information on that, in fact, look, if you wanna maximize growth, I highly recommend signing up for the course today and taking action, but check this out and we'll see you in a second. So how do we optimize lactate? Well, this study basically looked at one minute rest versus three minutes rest, 
and undoubtedly the one minute rest caused the greatest increase in metabolic stress compared to the three minutes rest. So what this means, if you're trying to maximize the pump, the conditioning effect you get in your muscles, right? Um, that roadmap veiny look, okay? Um, or getting growth from metabolic stress, then you're gonna wanna rest shorter rest periods, okay? Which mean really like only resting 30 to 60 seconds as opposed to three minutes. So you're gonna maximize the metabolic impact of growth when you're doing that as opposed to gaining maximal strength. Yeah, it, it hurts. <laughs> yeah. So Charlie's a guy who's a professional power lifter, right? Um, and um, you have obviously like talk about like some of some of the injuries that you have. I dealt how, with. how long do we have? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it'd be easier to tell you what I don't have, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, the big ones that knocked me out of lifting, I tore my patella tendon and I tore my pec, both from training at heavy weights way too often. Right. Never deloaded. Never. <clears throat> right. And. Right. That's how that worked out for me. Yeah, and it's the you same know. thing with me. I've, to I've torn my quad. Um, I've had a lot of injuries. It takes me an hour to warm up uh, just to do once before I can start my first set just of squats. Just to see if you can squat. Just to see if yeah. you can squat. Yeah. And this is like years of powerlifting, years of heavy lifting. That's just the price you pay. Dorian Yates, you know, you see it. he ended his career with, with injuries. You know, at one point in time, I think he, one of his last Olympias, he competed with a torn bicep. I remember that, yeah. Right? <clears throat> um, and if you look at guys like um, uh, Ronnie Coleman, mm -hmm. all of us, everyone, whether you're a bodybuilding fan or you don't know anything about bodybuilding, you know Ronnie Coleman. But if you look at Ronnie now, like he's he's, hurt. he's hurting yeah. bad. He's hurting bad. Um, where Dorian's doing fine, but he, he knew like, hey. He I'm, called it quits at a good time. He called it yeah. quits at a good time. He did. So, my point is this, guys. One thing we know, if you look at like the um, uh, weightlifting, for example, in the Olympics, a lot of these guys, you know, it, strength's not peaking till, it's not peaking till a long time. It takes a long, it's not like track and field. It's not when you're like you're doing, um, you know, sprints, you know, or running a 400 meter or whatever, where you peak when you're in your 20s. Strength might not peak till sometimes yeah. Late thirties, right? The champs are mostly in their thirties. Well, except for the guy that just broke all the records. I think he's what twenty seven. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But everybody else is mid thirties. <clears throat> yep. So it takes years. So when in in bodybuilding, if you look at the Mister Olympia stage, a guy who comes on who's thirty years old is the young guy in the crowd. Yeah. yeah. So for you, you just have to realize if you're going to feel, to build maximal muscle, don't you know talk about don't start counting reps till it hurts like don't start counting until you've like trained for 10 years and then you can see okay that's when you start to develop start to really see your body start to develop but it could be 15 years of of lifting before you reach your max muscle and you're not going to reach that by lifting 80 percent of or above of your 1rm every single workout as much as we want to do that as great as it feels to lift heavy you're gonna have to periodize your training, you have to lift lighter loads. Mm -hmm. And to do so, you just have to realize that it's not just, oh, I did a set of 20. No, you're gonna have to reach near failure to get those stimulating reps. Right, right. Yeah, I think I think Matt Wenning talks about this a lot too, <clears throat> where he says, you know, the best lifters aren't necessarily the best lifters, they're just the ones that survive the longest. They're the ones who survive. They, they've got to train longer than us. That's, That's why it. they're stronger. That's you know? it, it is a hundred percent right. But I think Sean Rhodes is a good example of a, Sean he Rhodes. won the Olympia, what, 2019, I think it was? Yeah. He was like 41. Yeah. And it was his first win. Exactly, 41. exactly. Yeah. So you guys are like watching this in your thirties and you're going, I'm, you know, oh man, you know, you have a lot of years left that you could put on a lot of muscle. So just realize that. Um, so, so let's talk about this. now. We talk about our the, the Sean was forty three when he won that. Sean was forty three. Yeah, and I was predicting Sean Roden would win it for a number of years. Yeah. So I asked Fernando. I was talking about Sean Roden years before he actually won, and I think he's one of the most symmetrical. Great physique. Yeah, uh, Mr. Olympia is probably since Dexter Jacks as far as symmetry is concerned. Right. I mean, Sean looks like he's out of the 90s. He does. He would have been right up there with a lot of those guys. He does. So one thing we talk about these classes, we talk about this, this concept of stimulating reps and what it means and how you apply it. When we look at this, there are studies that have done like the opposite. 
It's not just volume. It's not just volume. So they've taken um, studies where they've had people do three sets of 10, uh, right, or six sets of five. Now this three sets of 10 was still failure, or they did what's called cluster sets, where they broke it up into six sets of five, non-failure. And the people who did six sets of five non-failure, they didn't gain much strength, they didn't gain much muscle. So it shows it's not just a volume thing, that stimulating reps are, are, are very important. Um, so um, are there, one question we have that, that, that I think is good to address is, when you're talking about training 80% or above, or you're talking about training at 50% of your 1RM, um, are we growing in different ways, or is, it, is there different reasons why you think we're growing? Yeah, I mean, it could be. It's something we, well, we'll whenever we put out that, um, that range of motion paper, we'll discuss that further. But it's certainly plausible that at lighter weights, when you're doing more reps, you might be getting more sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Yeah. And which is essentially increasing the fluid component of the cell or the bits and pieces that are in the fluid component of the muscle cell. Yeah. Or lifting heavier, we typically associate with myofibrillar hypertrophy, which is just the growth of the contractile proteins in the cell. Um, and that's because we see that's directly related to producing force. So there's a thought that from, you know, in a long-term basis or in an aesthetic outlook, there could be different outcomes with year one. I think so too, and I think that's one thing is you may have guys who are like your traditional bodybuilders, I'm only going to train high reps, 8 to 12 reps, 12 to 15, sometimes 20 reps, I don't need to lift heavy, but the thing, because hey look, I'm, I just listened to Charlie, you know, and Jacob here on this podcast, so why don't I just lift lightweight so I never get injured? Well, the thing to understand is that's kind of the opposite way of things and thinking about. When you look at uh, growth, I think there are different adaptations to growth. We know tension's a major way you grow. Above 80%, you're gonna simulate your maximum tension. But the thing is that you start, to, your muscle fibers start to get closer together and they get denser. And that's called packing density. And so again, when you look at guys like Dorian Yates, when you look at guys like, um, uh, like Ronnie Coleman, when you look at Franco Colombo, their muscles are very thick and they're very dense and they're packed. That's what the heavy lifting gives you. But if you look at like um, the fullness of like um, a Sean Ray, for example, you know, old school bodybuilder like him, he didn't lift super heavy. He lifted heavier than most people, but, if, but relatively speaking, he's lifting 12 to 15 repetitions a lot of times. And so his muscles were full. And I think a lot of that is a higher repetition training. I do, do think there's a, a sarcoplasmic component I think there's a vascularity conditioning component. I think um, being able to get a, I think when your muscles are more conditioned, I think you can get a better pump. So when you actually pump up, the muscle expands more. So I do think that there's something to periodizing and getting a combination of all of those types of reps. Um, and if there's a place in them, how would you, um, when you talk about like periodizing that in a single week or a month, um, how do you recommend, if you're a bodybuilder who wants an equal amount of growth in all ways, how would you periodize that in a week? Yeah, well, I think one thing to add to what you were <clears throat> saying too is that we can get similar growth, you know, similar increases in muscle size from high load or light load training as long as you go to failure. But the one difference we still see is that high load training makes you a lot stronger. It does. Way stronger. It does. Light load training, especially if you're advanced, <clears throat> you're not going to get a lot stronger. So you look at the long-term gains, you still need to do some heavy lifting because that's going to pay off down the road when now you're squatting 315 for reps instead of 245 or whatever. You know? Well, and that's the point is we got to think about long-term growth here, okay? Mm -hmm. If you do look at the monsters, bottom line is this, when we look at mechanisms of growth, even if you're talking about training in an 8 to 12 repetition range, if you are stronger, you can lift an 8 to 12 repetition range with a greater load. And that greater load serves as greater tension, and that greater tension serves as a greater stimulus for growth. Right. So I do think that progressive resistance training becomes very important because when you're looking at these studies and they say, well, hey, I can lift light or heavy, I'm gonna grow the same. Long term, I would venture to say you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're, if you're not getting stronger, if you're, listen, a lot of times they go, oh, you know what? I can be really big and not really strong. 
Rel- probably not. Anybody who's big who's not strong. No, you can't. <laughs> exactly right. Now, I've seen guys who are strong that aren't that big, but I think, yeah. but I, I will say this, to be big, to be strong, uh, to be big, you probably need to have some strength. You yeah. need to have some strength. If you're weak as hell, you, let me say this, you will never reach your full potential if you don't use progressive resistance strength. So I think that is very, very important. Yeah. That's like we see that that classic range of eight to twelve reps. Well, the high level guys are still squatting four or five hundred pounds doing yeah, that. Yeah. You know, with perfect form. So yeah. like, there's definitely a place for it. But even to your point of how to split that up every week, to me I almost look at it as like a two week cycle. So, you know, most people are trying to train each muscle group twice a week. I almost split that up into uh, two week sessions where now you have four times every week, or four times every two weeks, I should say. Now you look at one session is high reps, one session is low reps, and maybe two of those sessions are moderate reps. And you can start to rotate, A, the exercises you use for each one, the, the type of uh, you know, focuses you use on each one. But for me, having been lifted you know, for a super long time, everything hurts now, that was the best way for me to make some sort of progress, yeah. was constantly varying the, the repetitions I was using. I was anywhere from three reps per set to 20 reps per set, yeah. which was terrible. Because I ended up one day, ended up having to do squats for 20 reps. And I was like, I don't ever do that anymore. So it will get you out of your comfort zone too, if you kind of think it of sucks. it that way. Yeah. 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 But I, if you're at that high level, you need that more consistent variation. To me, it's a good way to almost think about your training as two week cycles instead of one week cycles. That way you can add more variation in while still having something to kind of progress off of, if that makes sense. Yep, and there's lots of studies showing that the combination is better than Mm -hmm. any individual. If you stick with one individual rep range that you like, um, you won't grow as much and you won't get as strong. That's just a fact. Um, So based on that, um, when we think about that, we talk about a threshold of 80%, so all your reps are stimulating. We know anything below that is probably your last three reps. The question becomes, if I'm going to go try this and say my joints are hurting and I need to deload, but I want to still grow, what's the lowest percent of my 1RM that I could use um, for, to, reach the effect of, uh, re- to, to reach the effect of reps or simulating reps um, and maximally activate my muscle? Yeah. I mean, we have some research to go off of. We also just have theoretical physiology, we can call it. Like, so people will take this too far and say, I'm going to go grab the pink dumbbells and do a thousand reps. Yeah. You're not no. going to grow doing that. It's no. just not enough weight. Yeah. And there's a few reasons for that. A, muscle wisdom could play a role. Your muscles will learn what you're doing and they'll say, yeah, we don't need to activate that much for this. Yeah. They'll adapt as you go with time. Some people might say that's a form of CNS fatigue. You're reducing yeah. motor output because you don't really need it. Ultimately, you still need that baseline minimal level of tension even if you're doing, you know, 30 reps a set. And the research says that's probably about 30 or 40% yeah. of your one RM. Yeah. So if you can bench press 200 pounds, you're looking at minimum 60 to 80 pounds, then you're going to be doing 30, 40 reps probably. Exactly. And, and at that point, what's, what's the point? Well, that's, that's my, <laughs> and that's my point too. Why don't I just go 50%? You know what I right. mean? Like it doesn't even make sense. Like doing mm-hmm. 30, per, why would you do, why would you do that? Does it make, cause remember the stimulating reps are those last, couple reps so in reality probably you know 30 what Charlie's saying is 30 or 40 is like that's your minimum so if yeah if you're really messed up and your joints are really hurt and you got to do it sure do it but um if you're that messed up you need to assess why you're so messed up yeah (laughs) that you can't bench 100 pounds (laughs) exactly without serious pain exactly so practically probably 50 percent hits this hits 40 50 percent really hits what we're talking about. If you're going 30 to 40, you probably should be doing like blood flow restricted. Yeah. Um, so but you're not gonna wanna do more than about 20 reps, you'll be in pain. <laughs> exactly. So other ways, when we talk about simulating reps, other ways that you can like enhance the stimulating reps or get there faster, we talked about intensity, but also you can manipulate rest periods. You get there faster if you have like shorter rest periods, you might get to that stimulating rep thing that much faster. Um, any other uh, tips that you have on this concept of stimulating reps? Well, I know we've covered activation a lot. And then the other component of that was the slow muscle contraction. We touched on it a little bit. As in, essentially, you're not doing that on purpose. It's dictated by the weight you're lifting or the fatigue you have, mm-hmm. right? 
So again, we don't need studies for this, but we have studies for this. We also have eyeballs for this. You know if somebody's training with a heavy load, they're moving it pretty slow, right? Yeah. You know if somebody's within three to five reps to failure, they're going pretty slow, right? Yeah. So there you go. You really don't have to necessarily worry so much about that slow speed because if you're using a heavy weight or you're getting close enough to failure, you're getting both of those components of right. that stimulating rep, you know? Yep, exactly. Um, I think the final then, not necessarily the final, but the biggest question people are going to have, how many stimulating reps per exercise or per workout do you think you need to grow? That's a really good question right there. Um, that's a great question. What do you think? Why do you think on it? I have a funny study, or a funny story, I should say. I keep saying the word study so yeah. much. It's stuck I in know. my head. I... When I was doing grad school, I was a strength and conditioning coach at Ball State University. And the director of strength and conditioning, he's still there right now, Jason Roberson. Super, super smart guy. But it was, he was always funny because he had that seasoned strength and conditioning good coach approach to everything. Where grad students, we're trying to prove ourselves. We're pushing our teams to the limit, doing all this, that, and the other. Half the time, he walked in and said, hey, pick up something heavy and leave. And we're all like, what is this yeah. guy doing? That's, yeah. that's not – but it worked. Because he understood the cumulative fatigue his athletes were under. He knew they had tests coming up. Like, he, he knew how to balance that stuff. But I always remember we, we would have these roundtable discussions on Friday where basically he would just tell us we don't know anything. You know, go back to the books. Yeah. Come back smarter. Based, you know. But he, he always said for – he coached a basketball team, for instance. He was a big proponent of using 10 sets of three. He said, why would I do three sets of 10 – when I could just do 10 sets of three. Yeah. And we all left that saying, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't understand muscle growth at all. You have to do sets of eight to 12 to grow, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't. But we didn't know, you know, yeah. we didn't know. And yeah. so I look at that now and I say, okay, 10 sets of three, if we say the last three, maybe four reps of each set, or excuse me, three sets of 10, the last three to five reps per set are stimulating, right? Now you're at between nine and 15 stimulating reps. Yeah. You do 10 sets of three at 85%, possible. Yep, yep, yep. It hurts, but it's possible. It hurts, yeah. You've just got 30 stimulating reps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Technically, you are going to grow more from that 10 sets of three at a heavy enough weight versus the three sets of 10. You know, it's interesting that you say that, too, because I was looking at some meta analysis, remembering some meta analyses from like Matt Ray, with, um, and he was mainly, look, he was looking a lot at strength gains, but he's mm -hmm. looking at well trained people well-trained people and a lot of strength gains with well-trained people may be mu related to muscle growth at that point mm -hmm. so he was showing anywhere from eight to 14 um, um sets being um important for um maximizing strength with you know for body part and if you think about it it kind of fits within your strength coach's thing because that's, yeah. that's 20 24 to 30 something reps you know mm -hmm. um you know, or 40 something reps, basically with the eight to 14 sets. Well, this guy, your strength coach was saying, like he was giving you 30 stimulating reps, whereas the group that's doing, you know, um, the three sets of 10 might be getting nine. Right. And we're right. not, we're not, see that's the other thing is, and I think this is really important guys, and if you take one thing from this, it's not just training volume. It's effective training volume. No. A lot of people go, I did 20 sets today, right? And what do they do? If you did 20 sets, you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're counting to warm-up sets and yeah. stuff. It's yeah. so like, oh, you know, I did a set of 12, and it wasn't a failure. Then I did a set, you know, I did a three sets of 12, and I, I didn't work up to failure until my last set, or I didn't work up to it was hard to my last set. So they're pyramiding up, but they don't make it hard to, like, the fourth or fifth set. So they did, they did... 20 sets, maybe four different exercises on legs, and it was only on the fourth set of each one where they actually got stimulating reps. Yeah. How many sets did they really do? How many sets did they waste? Yeah, you how know? many sets did they waste? In the pursuit of body composition is one thing, because you burned a bunch of calories doing mostly nothing. Yeah. But if you're purely wanting to grow, I think that's how we can look at the way Dorian Yates trained. You said yeah. he did one, maybe two sets per body part yeah. per week. The dude got his stimulating reps in. Yeah. You know? He did. He didn't have to do five sets of 12. He, he did, did two sets of eight, but every single rep was excruciating. Exactly. You know, he got the same amount. And that's something that you guys might actually try too when you're journaling things out. 
maybe start counting your simulating reps per body part and see how you grow um, with that. Um, as opposed to counting total sets, maybe try and look at your total stimulating reps and, and start comparing them and, and see how you grow. Maybe it's not just a volume thing, maybe it's a simulating rep things, um, which is interesting. Yeah, I think to do that, pay attention a little bit to how fast you're moving. It's, you know there's a point in the set where all of a sudden the bar or the, the cable, whatever, the stack slows down, that's probably where those stimulating reps are starting <clears> to kick in. Yes. You do a set at 10, first three or four reps are pretty easy. You know, reps five and six, a little bit tougher. Then it's that seven, eight, nine, ten where you really start to slow down and grind. Those are your stimulating reps. Yep. So I'd say as you track three sets of 10, maybe on set one, reps seven through 10 were stimulating. Set two, six through 10, maybe set three, you pushed the weight, five through 10 felt stimulated. You know, right. something to think about and something to reflect on with your training because the more data you collect, that's the more information you have to keep improving. I think that thing where when you don't start counting till it hurts, probably when it hurts, like you pointed out, that's when yeah. it starts to become stimulating. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's a lot of great information. Is there anything else you want to add? I don't think so. I mean, I think it's this was a crash course on the topic. Yeah. Right? It's, we're still learning about this every day. We're still looking at the nuances of this and does it work in this situation, does it work in that situation. And realistically, the stimulating reps – theory, argument, whatever you want to call it, is almost solely focusing on tension as the as a stimulus for growth. But it's not the only stimulus yeah. for growth. So there is a metabolic stress component. There could be a muscle damage component. I mean, there's other things we could look at, but I think from an objective standpoint, this is one of the easiest things to track. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're going to be checking your blood lactate, you know, going to get MRIs done to see how messed up your muscles are after work. That, yeah. that stuff's not as easy to do, but this is something that's easy for anybody, I think, to journal and track as they go along. That's right. I agree. Um, and you can and you could periodize your simulating reps too, like Charlie yeah. was talking about. Your light days might just be, I'm going to just trigger a response. Maybe maybe that is where you get like six to, six to eight to nine simulating reps. Then maybe your high volume days are 30 simulating reps. Maybe your moderate volume days are, you know, 15 simulating reps. Yeah. And that's maybe how you start tracking your low, moderate, high volume days. Mm -hmm. um, so I think so. Again, take home message on this, guys. Stimulating reps um, are the point of set when you grow. And that's the point where you activate maximal muscle. Um, and generally speaking, if you're under 80% of your run RM, it's the last three reps of a set. Um, you, if you're gonna go under 80%, you probably should, you know, your lowest you can go is 30 to 40%, but unless you're injured, probably start at 40 to 50%. Um, uh, switch it up, try some different techniques. Don't be afraid to cross the 80% threshold if you're healthy. Try out um, what Charlie talked about, the 10 by three, instead of just doing three by 10. The point is there's several ways to grow. Within these stimulating reps, you might be triggering different adaptations. You should periodize. You should go all the way at the low end of the spectrum to the high end of the spectrum. And you should periodize it, whether it's within a single week or a single month. The more well-trained you become, maybe the more quickly you switch it up. Mm -hmm. Vary your volume by simulating reps potentially, maybe anywhere from as low to this three to nine on your low volume days. 12 to 15 on moderate volume days, and maybe up to 30 on your high volume days. Um, so different ways you can help with stimulating reps, you can manipulate rest period lengths, again, intensity. You can use intensification methods like blood flow restriction training um, and things of that nature. Um, but I think that's it, guys. We'll see you, we'll see you next time. Yeah. We're super excited. Yeah, thanks for stopping in, guys. See you guys.